Income tax 2023-2024 income line one, including W-2 wages and tip income. Get ready and some coffee because we often have to handle some unpleasant sensations when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the line instructions section of the form 1040 instructions tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused once again on line one income. Remembering that the first half of the income tax formula is in essence a funny income statement. An income statement having income minus expenses resulting in the bottom line of net income. The funny tax income statement having income minus deductions getting to taxable income as opposed to the net income. Also note that the income line item could be quite expansive. We're going to have questions as to what should and what should not be included in the income line item, noting that for taxes, everything is flipped on its head. So we would like to have income as low as possible because that will typically result in taxable income being as low as possible, which will result in less taxes. We also have to consider if there's other tax rates for certain types of income, ordinary income tax rate, the normal progressive tax schedules versus possibly capital gain tax rates or dividend qualified dividend tax rates, for example. Here's the income page one of the form 1040. You can see it's quite expansive with the different line items that might be included in income. Here's the schedule one, which feeds into page one of the form 1040 with additional income line items. Now, typically, when we're doing a tax return, the first thing that we think of when we think of income is the W-2 form. Why? Because most people are employees of somebody else, and we know that the employer has the obligation to produce the W-2 form, and we also note that they have the obligation typically of doing withholdings of both the federal income taxes as well as the Social Security and Medicare. That means the employer is doing the tax collecting job of the government. Instead of the employee being responsible completely for their own tax obligations, the employer has been made into the agent to collect uh, the taxes. And this W-2 form then is going to be reporting what the employer did, meaning they're going to give this to the employee so the employee can be a good taxpayer and put it on their form 1040. Uh, and they gave a copy to the IRS to make sure that the taxpayer is a good taxpayer and put this information properly on the form uh, 1040. Note then that something like a W-2 form is, is not something that you could basically put something different on the tax return from the W-2 form without almost inevitably getting some kind of letter from the IRS because it's not like the IRS has to randomly select your tax return to determine if there's some kind of incongruity because they have the W-2 form. The computer can basically check as to whether your tax return lines up to the tax forms they have been provided. That means that if there's an error with the W-2 form, something's wrong with it, then you're going to have to fix it with the employer typically because it's going to be a lot more difficult to fix it with the IRS. So if there's a problem with the W-2 form, then what your first go to would be go into the employer and say, hey, you have to fix this because you gave a copy to the IRS. And if I report the wrong numbers that you put on the W-2 form, then I can't, if I, if I report the right numbers, it's going to get hit for sure, almost for sure with a problem. So if you can't do that, 
then you might have to deal with the IRS side of things. But that's usually going to be the remedy that you're going to be looking into. Now, also note, we're dealing with federal income taxes with the Form 1040. However, their payroll taxes are also federal taxes to the degree that they're Social Security and Medicare taxes. Normally, with a W-2 type of taxpayer, they've already paid properly the Social Security and Medicare. So it's just a reporting form, and it's not going to add or cause any kind of changes to your calculations usually. However, you could imagine situations where you have someone who has two W-2s, and they go over the Social Security limit because there's a cap on it in which case Social Security could have an impact on your federal income taxes, right? And we also know that Social Security has an impact on your Form 1040 if you have self-employment income, which is often the case for sole proprietors. So that's the most common case when you're filing a Schedule C. So that adds a significant level of complexity when you have to deal with uh, Social Security on like a self-employment system. So again, your question is, as a tax preparer, do I want to prepare tax returns that are typically lower income tax returns, which are driven by these forms? Everything's basically automatic, systematic. I crank out as many as I can. I have a lower profit margin, but I do a, a lot of returns. Versus do I want to take on some of these more complex situations where I have to deal with the Schedule Cs and things that aren't always reported nice and neatly on these forms, in which case I'll charge more money for it. Uh, I'll take on more risk sometimes because they're more likely there's gonna be problems with those types of returns and I'll get a higher profit margin. So those are the things you wanna keep in mind as a tax preparer, what's your business model, and then think about which clients you wanna pick up. Noting that if you're, in a, if you're in a higher tax bracket system as well, it's often not worth your time then to take up low income tax returns because they can be quite complex in their own way because they have the earned income credit and the child tax credit, often family structures that could be difficult to deal with and could have citizen issues and whatnot, which are all complex issues uh, to deal with if, you're, if you don't have your model set up to do that, if your model is, is, doing with, is dealing with high income uh, individuals. And if your model is set up to systematically deal with those types of issues, on the low income side of things, then when, when a high income person comes in, it might not be, with your, be worth your time to do that one client and spend all your time doing these issues that aren't with your normal client base. So again, your goal is to say no to tax, to, to people that are trying to, you know, clients that, that want to get into your, your business uh, when they're, they don't fit your business model, right? You have to be able to say no to those people. Okay, so here's a, just a mock W-2 just to get an idea of these first boxes because these are the most important ones typically. So we've seen box one. It has to do with the, the federal income taxes. So note, when you're looking at those wages, there's the data input that we do for the tax return and there's also questions that you might have from your client for like other reasons, tax planning, and just general questions about their income. So if you wanna know how much someone earned, for example, box one might not be the best box to go to because this is your wages for federal income tax purposes. And, and you might have had something taken out of it, such as possibly medical insurance or possibly uh, a 401k plan or some kind of retirement plan. So oftentimes box five is actually a better indication of your highest income level, although it could have still been reduced by some items as well, because you're talking about Medicare wages, but the Medicare wages aren't typically reduced by like a 401k plan. And therefore that's the one that, that usually is, uh, you might see as the actual wages. Box one is the one that we're gonna use most commonly with the, with the form uh, 1040 because this is your income subject to federal income taxes and and then box two are the taxes that was withheld from box one where the employer was responsible for making those withholdings but doing so in accordance with what the employee told them with possibly the w-4 form the social security has to do with the social security uh, taxes this is your social security income, which could be different than box one, but could be the same. For lower income taxpayers, it will typically often uh, be the same, unless there was a, a deduction for box one of things uh, like benefits, 
like a 401k plan. If not, then you would think the social security would be the same until it hits a cap on the higher income side. Now, th this you're gonna put this into the system so your tax software can determine if there's any issues with social security, but typically the tax has already been paid and typically the tax has been paid correctly because it's basically more of a flat tax, whereas the federal income tax is that confusing progressive tax, which is impossible to pay the exact amount of tax. Therefore, we try to overshoot on the federal income tax. We file the 1040 to get a refund, hopefully, of a bit of that overpayment. The Social Security has been paid in full, typically, therefore no actual impact on the tax return. It's just a reporting uh, information. And the, Medi the Medicare, basically same thing, meaning the employee, the employer is forced to take the Medicare out of the employee wages. It's more of a flat tax. Therefore, it's already been calculated. So you have it on the W-2 for informational purposes. You will put it into the tax software, but it might not have an impact on your return uh, as the federal income tax withheld certainly will. Now we have a higher earner here. So box one is at 170,000. Box two, the withholdings of the federal income taxes, which are gonna be taken by the employer based on the information given by the employee, typically in the form of the W-4 form, 42,500. The social security wages are at 160,200. Now this is lower than box one. How can that be the case? Because you would think that box one would normally be lower because they might have put some money into, for example, a 401k plan where you would have compensation not included in box one, which might be included in box three. However, the social security has a cap to it, meaning if you get over a certain level, you no longer pay taxes beyond that threshold. Now, from a just a tax law standpoint, people will often question that policy and say, well, that is really strange you would think that as income goes up, they would pay more tax. That's what the progressive income tax system does that is usually applied to the federal income taxes. How can it be that the social security taxes actually get capped if you stop paying taxes over a certain dollar amount? And that's basically because my rationale or my thought process with this would be, well, the social security is basically being thought of as kind of, of a federal retirement program as opposed to a safety net or benefit program at this point. And if it was a retirement program, you would think that the more money you put into the retirement plan, the more you would get out in the form of benefits at retirement age, in this case, in the form of social security benefits. However, because it's kind of part benefit program and part uh, retirement plan, as you put more money in, your benefits go down and down until if you put more money in over a certain dollar amount, you're not actually getting any benefit when you get the benefits at retirement. And that's kind of why we have this weird kind of thing with the social security wages. And to me, again, it kind of has to do with the idea of whether we're dealing with a safety net program so that people who can't save for retirement have a safety net versus a kind of retirement program that everybody should be participating in. Now also note that this is a flat tax, 160,200 times 0.062. Uh, that's how we get to, let me do that again. I think I got it wrong here. 100, 100, 160, I can't type right. 160,200 times 0.062 gets us to the 9932. So that's what we mean by it being a flat tax, but then it's capped at the 160,200. Now the Medicare typically isn't capped. So in this example, we're gonna show it at, just to show that we have these three numbers that are wages, the Medicare uh, different. If you go above a certain level, you might actually have added uh, Medicare taxes, but the Medicare seems more like a, a welfare program or a safety net program as opposed to just a benefit for everyone. And you can tell by the tax rate because it's a lot lower, right? 170,000 times 0 0.0145, 1.45%. So that's at the 2,465. Uh, also note that with these two wages or these two taxes, the employer is also matching paying on their side at attempting to mirror kind of the idea of a 401k plan, which is often a structure for a 401k plan. So you can see in the design when they set this up, like in the 1930s, that they were trying to kind of mirror 
a 401k plan kind of idea in the structure of it. So you can see that, that the taxes for the Medicare could be the highest. Now let's go to the next example. So now we have all three of these boxes different. So we're at the 170,000 and then we had the 160,200 and then the Medicare wages is the highest. How did that happen? Well, you can see the wages up top are 170,000 and then down here we have the 10,000. That's the difference in this case between box one and box five. Why? Because we're gonna imagine that that 10,000 was money put into a, a 401k or some kind of retirement plan. So that meant that it wasn't included in wages for box one, but box three, that 10,000 would have been included in uh, the social security wages. However, it hit the cap at 160,200 and then the Medicare wages, that 10,000 is included. So that's why you get the 170 plus the 10,000. And that's why again, the Medicare wages, although not a perfect representation of actual income, is actually closer to the actual compensation oftentimes than box one, because box one, although we use it for taxes, has been reduced oftentimes by a significant amount for a 401k plan, oftentimes amongst possibly other things. All right, so line uh, 1A, total amount from forms W2 box one. Enter the total amount uh, from forms W-2 box one. If a joint return, also include your spouse's income from forms W-2 box one. So on the tax return, we could have multiple W-2s from one person, possibly from multiple people uh, if you have a married situation. Now, it used to be that you'd ha you had simpler returns because you often had one person working at one company for their entire life for the whole family. Now that's not the case. One person could be working five different jobs with <laughs> different W-2s jumping around all over the place. And of course, the spouse could be doing the same thing. So caution, if you earned uh, wages while you were uh, an inmate in a penal institution, r report these amounts on Schedule 1, Line 8U. So for all of our criminal uh, penal institution uh, members out there, keep that one in mind. So do not report these wages on line 1A. See the instructions for Schedule 1, line 8U. Caution, if you received a pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-governmental section 457B plan, and it was reported in box one of form W-2, do not include this amount on form 1040, line 1A. This amount is reported on Schedule 1, line 18. So those are kind of unusual situations. All right, line 1B, household employee, wages not reported on forms W-2. So if you're in a situation where you're a household employee, it's possible that you're, you're, even though you're basically an employee, that you might not be required to get a W-2 form because it's kind of a pain for the person that's higher. You know, it, this system is a problem for the person who is the payer, right? It makes it life difficult for the payer, which usually is a corporation, so, so the, the IRS is like, whatever, we'll make them do it. But a sole proprietor, even that, it's difficult to deal with the W-2 wages. And if you're just hiring someone to help you out with your housework and whatnot, then again, it could be difficult uh, to comply with the W-2 requirements uh, in that kind of situation. So maybe sometimes you're not required to have the W-2 requirements and you'd still have to include your income, however, in those cases. So enter the total of your wages received as a household employee that was not reported on form or forms W-2 and employer isn't required to provide a form W-2 to you if they paid you wages of less than 2,600 in, 2020, in 2023. Wages received less than 2,600, then you didn't get the, this is another area which is kind of similar to like the, the hair salons and the restaurants and the nail salons, the massages places where the person that's paying in those cases is not actually another business. They're paying for personal things that they are receiving, oftentimes paying in cash. And therefore it's a problem for the IRS because, because the IRS is gonna have less ability to double check that those businesses are reporting their income because they could have gotten paid in cash and because they can't pressure the person making the payment to provide a W-2 form because that person doesn't get a deduction on their tax return and therefore you, you don't have the leverage. 
So, so that's why that's why my conspiracy theory is they went after them during COVID because the IRS hates those businesses and wanted to shut them all down. And so, if you were in a massage parlor during COVID, the IRS shut you down. But they they happen to like their household employees, so 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 they make an exception for that one. There's those were, so. In any case, in any case, the same kind of thing happens here for uh, if you hire an an employee because that's really a personal expense. So even though they're basically an employee, you're not really a business. You might not get a deduction for their the work that they did. You might get a credit or something possibly, but so, so it's going to be more difficult for the IRS to require that W two form. Even though you don't get a W two form, you should still report. You know the income is the general idea. So for information on employment taxes for household employees, you can see tax topic seven fifty six for more information. Line C. Tip income not reported on line 1A. Enter the total of your tip income that was not reported on form 1040 line 1A. This should include any tip income you didn't report to your employer and any allocated tips shown in box 8 on your uh, forms W-2 unless you prove that your unreported tips are less than the amount uh, in box 8. So did you put one of those tips in your pocket? without logging it in without logging it down shame on you allocated tips aren't included as income in box one see publication 531 for more details also include the value of any non-cash tips you received such as tickets passes or other items of value although you don't report these non-cash tips to your employer you must report them on line 1c now tips is another area which has become a huge problem where the IRS, again, kind of cracks down on the business models that used to work because you have this cash situation and this tip situation primarily. In other words, if you owned a restaurant or if you own a bar or something like that, a, a nice business model is to say, hey, look, I'm going to hire people that are good servers and I'm going to pay them in tips. And, the, and basically, if they're good servers, they're going to get better tips and that'll be better for the restaurant. It'll be better for the employee. And we're going to attract people that like to like to work and earn tips. Right. Uh, however, the IRS is like, well, those tips are often cash and we can't see that that you've reported uh, the tips and so on. And so and so we would like to have information about that. So they want to force the employer to be the tax enforcing mechanism. So how can they do that? Ironically, the minimum wage kind of helps them to do that because they're going to say, well, you have to pay a minimum wage, which which they, if they keep on jacking up, you know, the, the minimum wage, then the, the you can no longer do that business model because they were getting paid in tips, which the employer wasn't including in their income. Right. So if you have to pay a substantial minimum wage, then you can't have a business model where they are just going to earn tips. So the minimum wage actually kind of crushed the tips business, which was kind of the backbone of a lot of s small businesses or people that are kind of entering into the workforce uh, oftentimes. And then they also want the employer to report the tips in some way. So if you worked at a restaurant, sometimes the employers has to pool the tips, has to report the tips so that they do report them on your W-2 income. So if they're on your W-2 income, then you will have them. That's a situation where the employer had to be the tax collector. So now they were put into the middle of what they didn't want to be involved in, which is the collection of the tips so that so that the IRS can basically collect the taxes on that. Also, tips are a cash based thing, which, again, is hard for the IRS to uh, enforce. So if you get a cash tip and you put it in your pocket, then, you know, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more difficult for the IRS to enforce. There's no audit trail basically until you put it in your bank, unless you don't you may not put it in your bank and there's no uh, there's no reporting documentation unless they can get the employer in the middle of it to report it somehow. In any case, tip, you may also, but the bottom line is that if you get tip, it should be income, whether you get a form about whether you got it or not is the general, the general rule. So tip about tips, you may owe social security and Medicare or railroad retirement RRTA tax on unreported tips as well. Keep that in mind. See the instructions for schedule two line five okay line uh 1d medicare waiver payments not reported on forms w2 box one so 
enter your taxable Medicaid, this is uh, Medicaid, I'm sorry, not Medicare, Medicaid waiver payments not reported on Forms W-2 Box 1. Enter your taxable Medicaid waiver payments that were not reported on Forms W-2. Also enter the total of your taxable and non-taxable Medicaid waiver payments that were not reported on Forms W-2 or not reported on Box 1 of Forms W-2 if you choose to include non-taxable payments and in earned income for purposes of claiming a credit for other tax benefits. So you have this situation with the Medicaid. Again, it could be something that possibly could be included in income. You might want to do a little bit more research if you're in that situation. When they talk about this item down here, so if you choose to include non-taxable payments in earned income, why would you do that? Usually earned income is bad and because it re results in higher net income and higher tax. Well, sometimes if you have an earned income credit, for example, you have certain credits where actually if your income goes up, you might have a tax benefit from it. We'll talk about some of those credits in future presentations and some things you might have the choice then <laughs> of whether or not you want to include something as income or not possibly because there could be a tax benefit due to say uh, credits, for example. So if you and your spouse both receive non-taxable Medicaid waiver payments during the year, you and your spouse can make different choices about including payments and earn income. For more information, you can see instructions for Schedule 1, Line 8. So Line E, Taxable Dependent Care Benefits from Form 2441, Line 26. Enter the total of your taxable dependent care benefits from Form 2441, Line 26. Dependent care benefits should be shown in Box 10 of your Forms W-2. So typically, again, that'll usually be on the W-2. And if it is on the W-2, then the employer was the one that was forced to do all the work, basically, and report it to you and the IRS of the W-2. And as you enter this into your software, there should be data input forms for it. So the more the stuff's on the W-2, the easier and more automated usually tax preparation will be. But first complete the form 2441 to see if you can exclude part or all of the benefits. So here's the 2441 child and dependent care expenses. And so you can take a look at it as well as uh, the instructions related to it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, if you are in that situation. Line 1F, employer provided adoption benefits from Form 8839, line 29. So this is somewhat unusual of a situation where you have the adoption benefits, but they could be significant in certain situations. So enter the total of your employer provided adoption benefits from Form 8839, line 29. Employer provided adoption benefits should be shown in box 12 of your Forms W-2 with the code T. So you're probably not going to see that often, but again, the employer has been forced to basically do the work on this one and it'll be on the W-2 and you basically, if it's on the W-2 with a T, then you can look at the instructions for it on the form W-2 on the IRS website and pretty easily, hopefully figure out where to go from there. But see the instructions, uh, form 8839 to find out if you can exclude part or all of the benefits. So you may also be able to exclude amounts if you adopted a child with special needs and the adoption became final in 2023. So clearly the tax code is being used in some to some degree here to try to incentivize certain behaviors such as adoptions, uh, for example. So in those cases, you want to see what kind of benefits would be available. And these are some starting points for the research there. This is form 8839 at the top of it, at least qualified adoption expenses. You can take a look at this form and instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Line 1G, wages from form 8919, line 6. Enter the total of your wages from form 8919, line 6 there. Line 1H, uh, other earned income. Tip, if you received scholarship or fellowship grants that were not reported to you on W-2, report these amounts on Schedule 1, Line 8R. So in those cases, you can see the instructions for Schedule 1, Line 8R. So other earned income, you have to be careful uh, with the other income because you, you can imagine situations where you have income that the IRS's general rule is that everything has to be included in income unless there's an exception. If there's not a line item des designated for that type of income, it would have to go into other income. 
Be careful, however, of other earn, earned income versus like income that's going to be subject to self-employment. So if you have an other income situation, the question is, is this income that is subject to basically self-employment, in which case you're also going to possibly have the schedule SE and you're going to have Social Security and Medicare possibly calculated on it, or is it income that's not subject to self-employment, in which case it's going to be included for income tax purposes, but hopefully not for the calculation of the Social Security and Medicare in the form of self-employment tax. So just a note, just be careful when you when you're looking at those income line items that don't have a designated area and you're trying to put them in other income are they subject to to uh self-employment tax or not the following types of income must be included in the total on line 1h so strike or lockout benefits other than bona fide gifts uh excess elective uh deferrals the amount deferred uh should be shown in box 12 of form W-2 and the retirement plan. So now we're talking about uh, box 12 and you're talking about one of the big benefits for an employee being putting money into typically a retirement plan of the 401k or a 403b or something like that. Now you only have a s amount up to a certain degree that you can put into those benefit plans and it's possible that you can put more into the plan. Why do you put money into a retirement plan? because you get a tax benefit typically at the point that you put it in, meaning it's not going to be included in box one of the W-2 and therefore you're not going to pay federal income taxes on it. However, you will pay federal income taxes on it when you pull the money out. So it's a deferral. That's why we call it a deferral, right? But there's a, a cap on how much money you can put in in any given year. It's usually fairly high for a retirement plan, however. So, so box 12, retirement box 12. So if the total amount uh, you or your spouse, if finally jointly deferred for 2023 under all plans was more than 22,500, so fairly significant amount, excluding catch-up contributions as uh, explained later, include the excess on line 1H. So then you'll have to pay income on that part is the general idea. This limit is A, 15,500 if you have only a simple plan so there's different types of retirement plans. The 401k usually having the largest benefit. And then you have a different cap for the simple, which is another kind of plan typically used by smaller businesses or 25,500 for section 403b plans. 403b plans typically like a 401k plan, but used for people that are, are government employees. If you qualify for the 15-year rule in publication 571, although designated Roth contributions are subject to this limit, don't include the excess attributable to such contributions on line 1H. Why not? Because a Roth IRA is kind of the opposite in that you don't get a tax benefit when you put the money in, but it's going to grow. And when you take the money out, you don't have to pay taxes when you take the money out of the Roth. So it's kind of like the reverse of a normal IRA. So uh, they are already included as income in box one of form W-2 because they're, they're a Roth IRA. They're already in income in the year that you put the money in. A higher limit may, may apply. By the way, when might you put money into a Roth versus a normal IRA? Usually, if you're in your highest income earning years, the logic is you put the money into a normal IRA, getting the maximum benefit because you have the highest income at this point in time, which means that you're going to be at the highest tax brackets. And then when you retire, you might be at lower income levels, possibly because of good tax planning, possibly because you're not living on the amount of money that you're earning. You need less money to live on, therefore taking less money out therefore resulting in lower tax brackets. However, you might be in a situation now where you have a lot of deductions, like a home, for example, uh, where the interest is deductible, lowering your income a lot, where as when you're retired, you might hopefully have it paid off. So you don't have that deduction, maybe. And you might guess that in retirement, the taxes are going to be sky high because of all this, all this entitlement programs are going to hit the wall at some point in which case the tax obligations are going to blow up. And so maybe the taxes are going to go up when I retire, in which case my strategy might be I pay the taxes now. And then when I retire, I try not I, I pull the money out and not have it subject to taxes because I think the higher tax rates are going to be at that time. So that's just one 
idea on why you might do a Roth versus you might you might want money in both, by the way, because if you had money in both, then you can take money out of each so that in retirement, you're you're if you took 100,000 out of both a Roth and a normal, then you're only going to be taxed on half of it, right? The 50,000, which hopefully will not put you in a tax bracket that's too extreme, you know, as opposed to being in the 100,000 tax bracket. Okay. A higher limit may apply to participants in Section 547B, Deferred Compensation Plans for the three years before retirement age. Uh, Contact your plan administrator for more information. If you were age 50 or older at the end of 2023, your employer may have allowed an additional deferral catch-up contribution. So in that case, you might have a catch-up ability to put more in of up to 7,500, 3,500 for Section 401k11 and simple plans. This additional deferral amount isn't subject to the overall limit on elective deferrals. So disabled pension disability pensions shown on Form 1099-R if you haven't reached the minimum retirement age set by your employer, but see insurance premiums for retired public uh, safety officers in the instructions for lines 5A and 5B. So if you take money out of the retirement plan, then you will typically get this uh, 1099-R. I think we're going to talk more about that uh, later. If you take the money out early, then you could be subject to penalties because the whole point of putting the money in was that you're going to put it, you're going to restrict it until retirement. So if you take it out sooner, it might not just be subject to taxes, which it will be if it's a normal retirement plan, but also subject to penalty. So disability pension received after you reach minimum retirement age and other payments shown on form 1099-R other than payments from an IRA are reported on lines 5A and 5B. Payments from an IRA are reported on lines 4A and 4B. Corrective distributions from a retirement plan shown on form 1099-R of excess elective deferrals and excess contributions plus earnings, but don't include distributions from IRA on 1H. Instead, report distributions from an IRA on lines 4A and 4B. Okay, line 1I, non-taxable combat pay election. All right, so if you elect to include your non-taxable combat pay in your earned income when figuring the I. Uh, the earned income credit, enter the amount on line 1A. So combat pay, you're in the military would be the scenario. You you have combat pay, which is going to be defined as combat pay. Now, typically, you might not have to pay taxes on combat pay, which means you get the benefit of not having to include it in income. Income typically being bad, so it would be good if you wouldn't have to include it in income. But if you are calculating the earned income tax credit, sometimes the earned income would actually result in a higher benefit, a higher uh, refund in essence, uh, because the earned income credit goes up. So you might get a choice then with, we don't want to, we don't want to create a disincentive for the combat pay by not including it in income. And therefore you get the choice of including it in income or not. And so you'd have to run the scenario if you're in the low income situation to see if it would be beneficial to include the combat pay. We'll talk more about that later when we get to the earned income tax credit. Okay. Were you a statutory employee? So if you were a statutory employee, the statutory employee box in box 13, your form W-2 should be checked. So statutory employees include full-time life insurance salespeople and certain agent or commission drivers, certain traveling salespeople and certain home workers. Statutory employees report the amount shown on box one of form W-2 on a Schedule C along with any related business expenses. So why is that important? Because now they might have, you know, the business expenses basically on uh, a Schedule C because normally the W-2 employee doesn't report on a Schedule C and usually isn't subject to the the, the Schedule C uh, self-employment uh, because they usually had it applied to them by their employer, but you also typically don't get the benefits of the expenses typically because you're an employee. So you could so you could have an exception here where you might have the Schedule C and possibly you have business expenses. You can dive into that in more detail 
uh, with the instructions for statutory employees if you have that situation. Missing or incorrect Form W-2. Your employer is required to provide or send Form W-2 to you no later than January 31st, 2024. So for tax season kind of starts basically in February, right? Because that's when at least everybody should have all their forms and by that time, at least their W-2 forms. So if you don't receive it by early February, use tax topic 154 to find out what to do. Even if you don't get a form W-2, you must still report your earnings. If you lose your W-2 or it is incorrect, ask your employer for a new one. So here is our situation where you, if you don't get it, then you can go to your employer and try to get it. Now, if they still will not give it to you, you're still responsible to file your taxes. They have sent that W-2 form to the government. So once it gets processed, you can actually go to the IRS if you need to, possibly get the transcripts so you can get the W-2 from that side, but that's not the ideal way to go, but it's there for you if you need to. Often that's an option or something you might have to do if you need to do your taxes for like three years ago or something and you haven't done them or someone else's taxes and you no longer have the capacity to go back to the employer. Now, if the employer made an error on the W-2 form, then you want to report the correct number. But if you report something different than the W-2, the IRS is going to kick it back. There's going to be problems almost for sure because they have a copy of the W-2. So you want to then go to the employer and say, hey, you have to fix the W-2 because you made an error and I can't file my taxes with the proper numbers because the IRS will kick it back and delay the refund and all that. So typically you want to go to the employer for any corrections and any getting of the W-2 first. And then if you can't get to it and straighten it out there, then then file the proper numbers and deal with the IRS side of things.